And oh, she's here. Come on up, Vanessa. And then upstairs we have um, adult survivors. And so wherever you want to be at this time, if you can transition, um, they've already began. Um, so upstairs they have labor, survivors from labor trafficking, sex trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence, and yes, we have a man on the panel. And so, um, because they are victims as well. So, but down here, we're going to hear from our, um, not on my watch, youth council leader, Victoria Pinnell. Um, the other ladies weren't able to make it. And so she's just going to, we're going to have a conversation, and she's going to talk from her heart, and then we can engage. And we do have also, Ooh. sorry, Pamela Jones, uh, Pamela Jones, would you stand? Did I mess her name up? I messed her last name up. Lady Pamela, would you stand? Okay. So she's also part of our youth council. Um, and in addition, we have one of our youth council members here. Uh, would you stand shy? Can we give her a hand for being here? A lot of them had school and testing and different things today, but she was able to make it this afternoon. And I'm going to have you come up, Han Shai, and be here as a support and to hear and to listen to what Victoria has to say. Um, and then we're going to be engaging and encouraging, etc. Okay? So you can have a seat right there on the table at the table. Okay, and so she's going to be talking from her heart, and Victoria's been doing this for several years now, um, not just as a result of being with me, us, at the Not My March movement, but she has been doing this since she was 12 years old, and she's had a passion for this since then, and so we definitely want to give her time and space to share her heart. She speaks all over, and I'm just excited about having her as part. And I'm just excited when you ask her what is it she see herself doing and, and if it's okay, can I share that with them, Victoria? She said, oh yeah, I'm going to be the first woman president in 2036. Yes. Yes. And so it is possible, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Victoria Pena. Thank you. Well, this is loud. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Victoria Pinnell. I am 17 years old. I'll be 18 in a couple days. I'm really excited. <laughs> I'm like, um, <laughs> uh, but this actually, my journey um, stopping people, trying to stop human trafficking started when I was 12 years old. Um, I did a public service announcement. So I'm an actress, um, SAG actor. I've been acting and modeling since, well, modeling since I was 10 months, acting since I was a little bit older. Um, but this had been, I had gotten called from my manager, hey, we want you to do a job, you, you know, of course, you can pay for it, tag after rules, conference, all that. Um, but going into it, I didn't know it was a public service announcement portraying a girl who had been sexually trafficked at the age of nine years old. And we call her Monica for safety purposes, and she was actually put in the sex trade by her father. And so I went into the, it's called Art Not War Studios, and I went there and it, it went in just being an acting job for me. And by the time I left and heard her story, that's when it became a life mission for me. And so ever since then, I've been speaking out on human trafficking and how, um, especially how it affects young people and also young people who are not even involved, how it affects them as well. Um, and the last, my major accomplishment that I'm incredibly proud of was I did a TED Talk in San Diego, California on human trafficking to a group of 500 young women and young men who are young and my age on human trafficking. And so I was able to, thank you, I was able to inform them um, on what human trafficking is, the signs of human trafficking, what to look for. Um, and how to get involved, because a lot of young people don't even know the issue exists, and if they do know it exists, they don't know how to get involved and how to stop it. Um, and so that was my job. That's what I did. Um, but I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi. I'm 12 years old. I'm a very cute pastor for the longest, ever since I was babies. She told me I have to be like a better person, and when I first started it, I was like, oh God. A few, like a few months ago or something, but I was like the founder of the group, and 
I learned a lot from her and what's out there in the city. And that's always the way of thinking. So we got the founder over here. So we were just introducing ourselves and I guess Oh, hello everyone. My name is Janae. I'm the Youth Outreach Manager for ECPAT USA. And I was asked to join the panel just to keep the conversation going, so I'm here. Um, so because we are missing a couple people from this panel, I really wanted this to be very conversation-based. And because this, young people, this panel is made of young people, we really just wanted to, any questions that you have for because obviously it's different, sex trafficking and how it works is different from a young person's eyes than it is for someone who's older. And so first off, I guess I would like to ask you any questions you have. Um, it can be addressed to any one of us. And so that's how we're gonna start. And you can come up here, it's fine. Okay, well, I think she's handing out, yes. Oh. How do you plan to uh, do outreach to reach more youth? Uh, any Who, whoever can answer that. Um, so at ECPAT USA, we have a Youth Against Child Trafficking program, and that's specifically targeted at young people to educate them about sex trafficking, specifically and the other forms of sexual exploitation. And so the specifics of that um, are really just reaching out to schools and different programs, letting them know about this important issue, and just really connecting with the administration and, you know, really just asking, begging them for their mercy to bring us in, to talk about a healthy relationship, to talk about online safety, which was addressed earlier, to talk about child sex trafficking, because as you all know at this point, um, a lot of people, when they hear the word trafficking, they think Asia, they think Europe, they think Africa, they don't think the US, they don't think New York, they definitely don't think Brooklyn. Um, and so we really try to make sure that young people as well as um, adults know about this issue. For me, because I'm not representing, well, besides the Not On My Watch Youth Council, I'm not representing any organization, I'm representing myself. And so what I do to make sure that young people are involved, I use social media because you can ask any young person and if they tell you they're not on social media, they will be lying to you. Um, so I use social media, I have a Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, everything de dedicated to letting young people know what human trafficking is. Because you can post something and it'll reach millions of people in like a second. And it's amazing. Um, and honestly, technology and social media can be our best friend and our worst friend um, and our enemy because, you know, a lot of traffickers unfortunately use social media to reach victims. Um, and this is something that I've discovered um, throughout the five years that I've been working against human trafficking. A lot of the times I'll look on um, someone's Facebook page and if it's a male and they have all females as their friends and they're all younger and the pictures that they have are provocative, that's usually someone who's sex trafficking, who's trafficking victims. And so there are signs that you see as you know, as you get more familiar with the issue um, surrounding human trafficking. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, they can, because I'm one of them. Oh. <laughs> um, I've been on Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, my girl, but she found out if you know, like, if you set up an email for them when they get older, and if they found out without you knowing, just go on the email and try to reset it, the password, and then it gives you a whole list. It's, you probably think it's complicated, but it takes like five minutes out of your day just to do it, to see if they're safe and if they try being trafficked and you can see all the friends and all the messages because I'm one of the people that I don't delete my messages, it's just something and I could get caught, I know, because I did, but <laughs> it's... Let, let, let me help answer that, okay? You don't know if they have an email account. A lot of the times they'll have more than one email, so you don't know which one to use. If you know the email address, you know the password to the email, you can go in and say, I forgot my password. What I did with her recently, 
because she was doing the wrong thing. Uh, I went and I took her email address out of as the email because they send you a reset to your email. So I put my email in there so that if she tries to change the password, I get notified. Also, if you go, if you can, you can get Dropbox. If you get Dropbox or some kind of cloud. Um, and you, you have it set to upload automatically, any kind of pictures, uh, possibly documents, but pictures and things like videos will automatically upload so that if they delete it, you have it. So that's just one thing. Yeah, that's one thing. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> my mom, so... Um, just for me, I think it would just be talking to your, you would be surprised, talking to your child, you'd be surprised at just how much there's a lack of communication between parents and their kids. My mom knows everywhere I go. If I go somewhere, you best believe she knows the person I'm going to and she knows the time I'm coming back and she knows how to find me if I'm not there. So I think just asking your child how their day is and even if they're like, if they brush it off, they're like, okay, fine, whatever. Keep asking them because eventually they'll be like, well, maybe, you know, maybe I can talk to my parents. Or even if they're in school, make sure you show up at their school events, their school functions. Just really show your presence in your child's life because it matters. And it means a lot to a child to see that your parent really cares about you and loves you and, and is willing to take the time to ask you if you're okay. Because parents, you guys know, you know when something's wrong with your child. So if you're there constantly and you're asking, you know, what's wrong? Is there anything I can do for you? It'll make eventually the child loosen up and they'll tell you. Um, I was definitely going to talk about that. Just really, I think a, an even more effective approach than to try to hack their Facebook and things is really having a relationship with your child or your, um, if they're not your child, the person that you're taking care of. Um, one, because as you said, you know, young people and people in general just want to be heard and just want that connection. But two, technology is really, really advanced these days. There are secret apps um, that you can hide stuff on, whether it's email, text, video, and okay. it doesn't look like an app. It looks like a calculator okay. or certain things. And so you wouldn't want, in my opinion, you wouldn't want to push your child to then say, well, you know, I don't have privacy. Now I have to get these secrets out. And then you don't know what's going on. So I think a, a more effective approach is definitely just keeping um, open communication with your young person. And I think a lot of times we underestimate how much young people can handle or how much they go through. Um, and so really just checking in with the young person is really, really important and just letting them know that you care. And you obviously show that you care by saying, I know what's going on sort of thing, <laughs> which is great. Sometimes, you know, as young people, we have to be called out on that as well. But there's a certain amount of respect that comes with that. So just like you're able to sit up here and say, yes, grandma caught me doing this or, you know, whatever happened. Um, and you said, you know, your mom knows where you're going all the time. I'm 20, I'll be 29, and my mama knows where I'm at all the time. Um, <laughs> and that's because there's a certain level of respect that we have. My mom, both my parents, my mother, actually, I just finished working with my dad. That's why I was literally coming in. Um, you know, we have this relationship where they're my best friends and I will tell them anything if I'm terrified, if I'm angry, whatever it is. And I would just encourage you all to have that relationship with your young person too, whether it's a child, a niece, you know, a foster child, whatever it is. Really just young people want, people just want to be heard and want to know that they have somebody that cares. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. So for me, a lot of, it's a little difficult for victims to respond to you on social media only because usually their social media page are watched by their pimp or their trafficker. And so if they find out, if, if their trafficker finds out that they're trying to get help through social media, it can lead to more punishment for them. And so usually to reach victims is not my, my way through social media. I, I create awareness through social media. Um, but for me, I've actually had I'm very um, happy to say this. A couple of days ago, me and my mom rescued a girl who had been um, sexually trafficked, and we got her back home. We took her to the hospital. 
Um, and we actually, they arrested the person who was trafficking her. And so now we're working with the police department to um, go a little bit deeper and find out where the source of the trafficking was coming from because that was just one person and it's a whole network that's, that's happening and going on. Um, so we've been in contact with the family and it's one of the best feelings of my, and which is why I know this is my life's work, is being able to return a girl or even a boy to their family. That is the best feeling ever because, you know, the tears and the emotion, it's just, it's, it's a great feeling. And so um, we've definitely rescued um, some young people. And uh, when I told you about the public service announcement I did when I was 12 years old, the girl, Monica, um, we were actually, I got a chance to meet her and other victims of human trafficking. And we were actually able to help some of them out as well. And so this is... Um, rescuing, it takes a lot of energy. Um, it's a very emotional process. Um, it takes money, it takes resources, time, um, because you have to be able to go in secretly and come out secretly. And so um, I, I, I've been blessed to be able to help um, girls who have been trafficked. Okay. I, can I, I just wanted to add something for the parents, the grandparents. I nowadays it seems like parents are afraid of their children. They don't want to violate their privacy. Well, you know what? They can have privacy when they're 18 and they have their own apartment and they're out of the house. But in the meantime, you can't be afraid to confront them. You can't be afraid to confront the people if you find something on their phone or whatever, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Kick, all these other things, Instagram. If you find something on there and you see and you have, they have the boys, or you know, they have their names, there's a way to track them down or, and talk to them and basically, you know, you can't be afraid to confront them. So that's, that's one thing that parents need to get, you know, you know, just do it, you know, go back old school that, like that. You can't, don't let them, don't give them their head basically. Take their phone away, take away their tablets, their computer, whatever it is. You have to make a point. There has to be consequences for their actions. And if they, they, there's none, then it doesn't mean anything. Um, yeah. I, well, I was just going to say, I agree. My mom has my password to my phone, my Instagram, everything. Um, but also because I don't have anything to hide. And so I'm, I'm very comfortable with my mom having everything I own because she knows all of my friends. and she know, But I'm, more, I'm also comfortable because... Okay. Because just in case if anything was to happen, she knows where I'm at and she knows I'm safe because she's so involved in my life. And so I would encourage that to parents be very, very hands-on with your kids because you just, honestly, these days, you just don't know. Like she was saying, the calculator app, I had that at one time. Um, the calculator app where it just opens up to pictures and everything you didn't even know was, it's, it's crazy. Technology is amazing and it's also the worst. So I saw her hand first and then I'm like, mm -hmm. Can you speak up just a little bit louder? We can't hear you. Yeah. Um, I have a question in regards to the news. A lot of times, in like in the news or in like during the commercial break, it will say that this child is missing, maybe two years ago. Uh, some of these people are the ones that go into trap into this type of trafficking because you don't necessarily. Some of them you may hear that they got murdered, unfortunately, but the majority of you don't you don't hear about that. Just know that two years ago they went, or three years ago they went. Um, do you, are those anything that you know that they got into trafficking? Um, I, I really quickly, kidnapping is definitely a major part of, of trafficking. Um, a girl or a boy these days will go all beyond their way to school, and then you won't hear from them again because somebody just snatched them up. It is so easy, and especially through social media, it is so easy to track someone and find out where they're at and just take them without anybody knowing or seeing anything. And so a lot of the children who are missing, um, and you get the alerts, that's because they are being sexually trafficked. Um, so it's definitely possible that some of those children or most of them are being trafficked. Um, if you really want the numbers, there's the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NEPMEC, and they, um, they're all about the kidnapping piece, um, missing children in general who maybe not have been kidnapped, but maybe have wandered off with a, a partner or, you know, an older person, um, and that exploitation piece, and so they have lots of stats and information about that. So I would definitely, if you're interested in knowing those exact numbers, I would... Um, recommend that you check out their website. Also, um, 
Backpage.com is one of the leading websites in for human trafficking, so oftentimes you'll find their picture on Backpage for an ad, um, and you can actually see, you know, it'll be the same person that you see on the news that's on a Backpage ad. So, so I just wanted to, um, I think you gave a valid point about parents and relationship, but I, I just want to say there's an age where young people just don't get along with their parents. So, mm -hmm. And I mean, you that age. try to be right. <laughs> so you may have a relationship. I have a 15 year old. I think I have a relationship with her. But I can tell you in a minute, it's like, oh, why you need to be around my friends? I am a parent, though, that's Too bad. Her friends like me. So <laughs> I'm a friendly person. So she wound up having to be with me because my friends like her. But what I want to say to you is I'm not sure if parents can really have that relationship you're talking about because there's this embarrassment. I mean, I'll just mention, I talked about going to my daughter's school for lunch, to take her to lunch, and you would think that would be great. And she was like, ah, oh, don't show up. And her father, but we do have a tracker. And we have a tracker that she doesn't know about. Because we're that clear. Like, I'm very clear. Because if you tell them, then they know. Mm -hmm. But we all of a sudden say, well, why does your tracker say you're in Queens? Because she goes, but the tracker could be off. So we have to make sure we call her just to say, are you in school? Without her knowing that we're tracking. I, well, I, I feel her pain because my mom, <laughs> I mean, let me tell you, my mom came to detention with me in ninth grade. Right. She sat in detention and clipped coupons. Right. And it was so bad. I'm serious. It was a, it was like the worst day of my life. She sat there and clipped coupons, made sure her hair was looking crazy. She had on the worst outfit ever. And then the other girls who were laughing at me, she looked at them like I'm gonna hurt you if you even laugh. And they just said like, it was it was the most quiet detention I've ever been to. Um, and so I get it. I really do. I get it. <laughs> She's upstairs if you want to be here. I had detention because I liked it. It was a ninth grade. It was real stupid. I liked this boy, and he went to detention every day, and I wanted to wait for him, but I didn't have a reason to. Oh, I didn't have a reason to stay at the school, so I got detention. I learned real quick that that was not the way to get attention, and it was not, not <laughs> no, not no. Bad. absolutely not. <laughs> so, yeah, my name is I'm Erica. And I'm from Black Lives Matter in New York, and so I've been um, brought into this work, working with youth, your age group. Um, really through Kim first with our sorority um, doing a symposium and then working with um, uh, Reverend Q, working with Jim. No, no, no. Uh, we did a Find Our Girls March in April. April 9th was our biggest march. And we marched all the way from the fearless girl <laughs> representing women, the voiceless, all the way to Marcus Garvey Park where Dr. Umar spoke. And so we're steeped in Marcus Garveyism and Malcolm X and all of the pioneers that speak about black liberation. And so we are very dedicated to this work. So the work that I'm doing now is similar to you. I have parents that call me, but the way I work with them is I call them. If I see a missing, I call them. And the first thing that I've been trained to do is first ask them, do you think it's sex trafficking? And a lot of times with this parent that we've just worked on a rescue with your age group, basically she was like, I think so because it's different. And understanding it's different. So I'm gonna just give you personal. I didn't get along with my mother. My mother's a, as a counselor. She's a social worker, she does all that stuff. I did not like my mother. I could not stand my mother. I was also vulnerable because of it. Because my mom showed up at everything, whether I wanted her to or not. I think in some ways she kept predators away, but that didn't stop me from wanting to go away. I didn't run away, but I was very smart. I did my work, I did everything I was supposed to do. But I knew I was vulnerable. And so I want to say to parents, it's a balance here. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you will like your kid and sometimes you will not like your kid. You got to be honest about even personality. If my mother was not, my mother would be hanging out. Probably not. Just be honest. I think we've got to stop um, glamorizing and romanticizing this relationship yeah. between mm -hmm. mother and daughter. And we've got to start to understand yeah. about mutual, mm -hmm. about mutual yeah. respect. Um, and also just knowing me as a woman, learning myself as a woman, that my role as a woman is not going to be as hers as a woman, and having that understanding and balance. And we're just doing that now, and I'm over them, okay? So I just think that when I think about the vulnerability that we're talking about in these young girls, is yes, talk to your kids, but you can over-talk them too, right? We, and we're not listening enough. Sometimes the, the kid goes, mm, I don't know, uh, I know parents give up. 
But you know, you gotta start taking on those mannerisms too. Sometimes you gotta play the same thing like, I don't know. What are we gonna do? I don't know. You know, hey, and we do because and I'm telling you, I've talked to this um, this woman, this girl's been trapped. I've got two girls that I work with, three. One's a survivor, working with her, doing really, really well. But one is already in a situation now, she's in Delaware. They're trying to deprogram her. See, now they're in the deprogramming phase because we know that she's attracted. There was a sting operation. There's so much that she told her mother, but she's not said what she's done. She said what everybody else did. And if you know about New York state law, until we can prove coercion and fraud, right. and she's got a, we, we don't have a case. Nothing's gonna happen. But the other girl that I work with is someone that wants to tell me what's going on and then says, well, what do you think? And I said, what do you think? Because it's not like you tell me about Satan's angels. There's a group called Satan's Angels where you take a lot of pictures. But the whole point is you have to have these tattoos. And these tattoos have to have roses and black roses and things of that nature. I take her in for services. She meets me. But what does she meet me with? She's late. Why? She was getting a tattoo. We just talked about that. So understand that, that, that she's not ready. And also that's the, the frontal lobe is not developed. So these kids, whether you have a wish or not, will do and say, it's impulsive, but it's also an addiction, and it's trauma bond, it's all these things that you haven't done, you know, you haven't let go, you've had people control you in your life. And so I'm thinking, I'm giving you freedom of choice, but yet social call go, I just got kicked out of somewhere, or I just got beat up. And you, you go, okay, so what, what, what do you mean? She doesn't know, but she just wants someone to be there. I will be there when she's ready, because it's gonna be when she's ready, right? But I think that for teenagers, I think I commend you all, and I commend your work. I just know that we have to understand that when you're talking to a parent, it's more difficult than what it is. Mm -hmm. you, like you might be a great kid, and you and your mom got that going on. My mom had a sad day, done coupons. My demeanor, I would have shut her all the way down. I would probably not talk to her for three or four years. Oh, in, my, in my spirit, no, 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 in my spirit. And when your spirit's broke, I'm more vulnerable. Right. I didn't learn anything that mom is going to show up and I won't do it again. I just learned how to keep disconnecting. And so if somebody wanted to isolate me from a situation, it was very easy to do. Because they were giving me freedom. They were giving me something that I wasn't getting. I could be me. Does that make sense? Yeah. So all I'm saying is parents, counselors, we got to really, one, be really honest about relationships and how we build them. Not safe space, but brave space because kids, parents talk to kids certain types of ways that make a kid feel like, wait a minute, I thought you knew I was getting abused by Uncle So and So. They, they think that you know everything. My mother told me, oh, actually, I don't know everything. I know it sounds like I know everything, but until I realized my mother didn't know everything, I was like, oh, okay. So then there's a little room here for maybe there's something that we can be doing different. But I think that there's this whole thing about if you have a good relationship with your kid, it's not going to happen. I'm just trying to say that's not necessarily true for every single kid. Every kid is different and every relationship is different. And I commend parents for hanging in there and you don't give up on your kids. But how we show love for some student, for some children, is different for another ch child. So the five love languages they talk about in romantic relationships, I'm sure there's something different in a, a, a maternal or paternal relationship, right? So I just want to just be really, really transparent and say, love them, but know how to love them. Learn how to love them. Learn what they mean by caring for me. I asked the girl, did your mother care about you? This is the girl that's being trafficked. She's not self-identifying. She says, yes. I said, does your aunt care about you? Oh, yes. Grandma, yes. And I said, well, what's what's the problem? Nobody cares about me. She just, So understand how our mind is thinking. She said, nobody thinks cares about me. You just told me an assented, but no one does. And then she says, well, right, and the random, and that's the problem. And the what? They, they tell her, she says, everybody, no one else, no one cares about me. But she just no. named three people that did. that did. And what did you just say, ma'am? Yeah, because that's what they tell her. That's what they tell her, so we but know she she's been programmed. Feel right. She doesn't feel mm -hmm. it. So it's like me decoding, and thanks to this woman right here who I text in the middle of the night, when I get certain <laughs> things, I don't, I'm stuck. I'm going, I'm stuck, but she likes talking to me. But I know by her talking to me, I'm getting more out. But, you know, it, it takes a village. So her mom, instead of coming here, is up there in Delaware just trying to just spend time with her. Right? But this is the person, she's at her, she hates her mom. Right? But she cares about me. So we know she's going through this duality. And she's 16. Most 16-year-olds do want to get away from their parents. 
You romanticize about going to college, never coming back, get your own place, right? Being a grown up, and what does that mean? So I just think that I commend you all. Um, and if you guys can continue to talk to peers, I would love to get your information because, you know, how peers talk to peers is very different. Because y'all sometimes don't even talk what you talk. And I love that about when I see the young people do that. They're talking without talking. And they get more information. And some of the stuff that I know that we wouldn't have gotten if a peer did not talk to another peer. But we have to be very careful with those peers who do this kind of advocacy like yourself. And I pray for you and pray for your world. So that, so that you don't get sucked in and you become ineffective because that world, you got to snap out of it. It's a, it's a different world. It's a different mindset. It puts a lot of trauma. I'm an actress as well. I'm a massive fine artist. It puts a lot of on you. And you feel a lot of spirits messing with this spiritual world. It's a spiritual warfare. So just, I just pray for y'all journey. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your comment. I, I'm, I really want to exchange information with you. But when you say that, you know, um, it, it does take a lot. It takes a lot of you really, after you, especially going into, when you see it, if you go into a brothel or if you go into a home that's has it's, um, the ring for human trafficking, you really have to take a moment after that and of, of self-care, which is what I really loved about the panel they were having earlier is talking about um, mental health and not being afraid to talk about it because it is so important because this type of lifestyle will mess you up even if you're on the outside of it and you know everything about it and you're strong and you know it, it's, it will mess your mind up and so it is so important for both the girls who are being sexually trafficked but then the ones who are saving them to get the proper mental help they need um, and we have to as a community we can't be afraid to talk about it because it's you know mental health is that topic where it's like you know especially in african-american families because i'm african-american it's like you don't tell nobody our business you keep that within our household you don't tell nobody that um, and so it is so important to be able to talk about it and, and not be afraid um, to really wow. say, you know, how you're doing emotionally. That's really, really important. Um, and shit. Any other questions? I mean, this is a, this is a discussion. So, or, or any comments? I do have to say one thing about the saving. The word saving is a very dangerous <clears throat> word we're using. I think we say it because it's rescue, save, rescue. but... How do you have, what are we saving? That's what I really think about. When we say saving someone, is that really even possible? When I use the word save, I would or rescue, I would say saving from the physical trauma in the situation, but it takes a minute to save them from the psychological damage. And so when I say saving, I, I mean physical, from being in that physical place and just, they're getting away from that. Um, but mentally, it takes a, it takes a while, and so you can't even say that you you rescued someone mentally because they have to do that themselves. You have to give them the necessary tools and the resources, and be there and, and surround them with the love and care and everything you can give them. But they have to be ready, and they have to you know they really have to come out of that themselves because you don't know you know where you saw them, but you don't know what, they, what they've been through. You don't know how that trafficker, that pimp, or that John broke them down in the process of getting them to where they're at. And so that psychological repair, it has to be done on their own because they're the only one who's, who's known the journey they've come from, they know what they've been through. I saw, I think I saw a hand. Yes. So ECPAD is actually not a direct service organization. We do prevention work. So we focus on advocacy and legislation. Um, we work with the hotel um, industry and we do the youth education. So we don't come in contact um, like you're kind of speaking to or like you may experience with actual victims. Although we have had a few youth come forward and say this is happening to me and then we refer them to certain organizations. My line of work is mostly with victims who reside in the United States. Um, I've actually never come in contact with someone who's not from here. Um, 
so I wouldn't even be able to answer your question, um, but that's actually something that I want to know, so it's something that I'm probably going to research after this. Um, but you were talking about legislation, and legislation is really, really important when it comes to preventing human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very, very proud to say that actually um, I had a meeting with Congressman Esquiat, and he has agreed to um, sponsor three bills that I've written, and I'm really, really proud of it. Um, the first one is mandatory life sentencing. Um, I believe, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's harsh. Well, it's also harsh to rape and, and sell a girl. Um, and the second one being that all assets collected when a trafficker is arrested go to the victims. And if the victim is deceased, because we also know that organ trafficking and human trafficking go hand in hand, if the victim is deceased, then it will go to their families, and if we cannot find their families, then it will go to an organization that is working incredibly hard on anti-human trafficking. Um, and then the third um, bill is mandatory signage at adult entertainment places. Um, so a strip club, adult entertainment, whatever it may be, having a sign that says if you suspect human trafficking, whatever, you call this number. We're still working out the details of it. Um, but that's a broad sense of what it is. Um, but a lot of people, you know, legislation is, I feel that is one of the most important things you can do um, in trying to combat human trafficking and so um, I would just say you can start one of the things you can do is start or sign a human trafficking petition um, it, it's honestly there's so many little things that you can do um, just to contribute to ending and creating awareness around human trafficking um, any, any questions? Um, I do have no. one I have, um, I've had a young lady so I think I'm talking to the young lady in the middle I had a young lady from my church. She got on the internet and she met some five. And when she met them, she, I guess she she befriended them, right? Some guy. And while she was on the phone, the guy asked her to do something. She said no. And all of a sudden, there was this photo of her wow. naked. And she had taken it in the bathroom. And he, as soon as she gave, she sent it to him. He spread it out. He sent it out. And we caught it, right? Some people from the church had, like me, I had, I had to tell her mother, go in the bathroom and get her. Get uh. out that bathroom. And by the time she knocked on the door, the daughter saw the picture because he all posted it. So she's screaming, the mother's screaming. At the same time, like, open the door. But this is the thing. The girl was so vulnerable that she gave the guy her password. So I'm just, I wonder what you, your thoughts on that. Because at that point, by the time we got to the cops, the cops said there was, he had circulated it. Do you want a free time? And then we could see, but we couldn't stop her picture from going around because he had her password. And so... I want to know what's your thoughts about that because is that an honest trap that could possibly happen? Like, and how could somebody get involved in it? Um, no, I, I want to hear from her. I, I, I wanted, I heard a mother, but I want to know how common that is. Um, it's very common. Tell me it's why. Happening. Tell me how we missed it. Hmm? How did we miss it as adults? Like. Okay. I, yeah, I missed it because as adults, y'all gotta be, like, I'm not gonna say more protective, but, like, y'all gotta, y'all have to be more educated in your daughter's or, or Sons. boy's life, and they're just be there for them. And like again, they do need. Um, I know some people that did that in my school, and they got exposed. Yeah, my principal found out everything, but they got exposed hard, and it's very scary. It's just because these men and boys out here is just sweet talking them. And y'all gotta just tell them and sit down with them and tell them what is these boys do, they do, and how they're gonna tweet talk you 
and they have to be prepared for their signs already and what to do when it happens. Because if you don't at an early age, it's going to affect them when they grow up. Because they're going to say it's your fault and stuff, but well, it really shouldn't be because you guys, you guys probably think that they're too young and all. It doesn't matter because it does happen at a young age. It needs to start and you can't be scared. Yeah, you need to talk about them like they're 20, 30, because it could happen anytime, anywhere. For example, my friend, she, she's been tra um, trafficked, she's been depressed, and she's been sending nudes to people. I'm her friend still, but I'm the only one that she told. I'm not going to share information all, but it's scary out there. You just got to tell them at a very young age. But then how does it make you feel? Now you carry this burden at 16 years. 12. She's 12. You carrying this burden. You, a 12 year old, is carrying this burden. So I'm understanding you're not going to out her. But now, how do you sleep at night? How, I'm not making you the guilty one. What I'm saying, that's pressure that your grandmother, I want to take it. I could be your, your I could be grandma, I could be mother to your grandma. I'm that old. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying. This is serious. You could be my great grand with no scandal. That's how serious this is. So I would never, well, like you, I would never want you to have that pressure. It's not pressure. It's just that she trusts me. You gotta make sure that your daughter trusts you or your son. So like, you can tell your grandma. Are you giving, can are you giving get, her any information? To yeah. Drop I told her, come to this after school with me to see Reverend Q, mm -hmm. Tuesdays. She went, but last time we didn't have the meeting because she wasn't there. But ever since then, she couldn't. But I told her, be careful out there. And lately, we've been going to the counseling together so she could talk and sit down. But it's hard for her to express her feelings. She only talks to me. She doesn't want to be, she's just scared of everyone else, even her parents. Because I seen her on conference night in the bathroom. She was scared. But Did you tell your grandma? So where do you put, where do you put your, your heart? Where, where do you put your, your I just heart? try to be there for her if she needs anything. No, you. I'm not talking about her. We, we, we got you. We got, I know your, you, got, you got her back. Who has yours? Who have you invited in to get your back? Because baby girl, he to your right says she got her parents. She has her parents. They know the right, right, left, and center. Your grandma has you, what you allow her to have. So this is your, this is from your mom. <laughs> so the only thing I'm saying, no, no, the only thing I'm saying is, I need you to see now, and it's just as sis in the back said, you, you, this is not about anybody else but you. This is about you. I want you safe, and I want you well. Because it takes a lot of strength to be up here. Mm -hmm. To own, I made a mistake and my grandma busted me. But that takes a lot of strength. And yes, you are being there for her, your friend. But I need you to now, as this an old head, to say you just need to make sure. You don't have to out her. Please hear what I'm saying. I just need you to sit on your grandma's lap. And then well, the, uh, the Latin culture. Too big for that. Old, old Latin's color. Well, this is my, my closest, my great great grandmother is like this. You would get in the bed with her, your grandmother. You get in the bed with her and you just spoon her. You just go right with her and you go to sleep. Yeah. Because that, no, that's a, that's a coach. That's like nursing almost. The baby with the baby in the bed. Because that's a serious kind of thing. Because that's when you start to work. That's when. So that's it. I just, that's what my issue was. It's all about you right now. Yeah. You have to have an outlet for yourself yes. when you're carrying all of this information about other people and their pain, to have an outlet to share what all of this stuff that you're you're keeping in your heart and your head for other people so that way you don't become sick or have a nervous breakdown. Her? That's that's the point that we're trying to make to you is that you have to Please? find ways to take care of they yourself to stay whole and healthy. Mm -hmm. Emotionally and physically. For emotionally and physically, like me, I get very mad easily. I, I used to not get like this. 
but I am. And it's just, I know some people that I could go to that I could trust. Like my counseling, I go to my guidance counseling, I go to Pastor Q, I go to my two speech teachers, I go to my teacher, he's like a mom to me in this girl phone. And I just sit down and talk to them any time of the day in school because I feel comfortable with them and I let I just let out. Yeah, they see me cry and all. I just let out everything. Okay. All right. Just a quick question though on that. Like how do you find that to be therapeutic for yourself to be able to do you feel that helps that helps you to unlet um release some of the burden that you feel like you're yes. carrying. Do you tell your friends, though, that this is a great outlet to go to and that, because advocacy is nothing more than just talking about a, about a certain subject or about a certain cause and trying to get as many people as you can to learn about the subject. That's all advocacy is. So it's not really pressuring them saying, you should do therapy, you should do therapy, mm -hmm. but just saying, this helps me. Right. Maybe you should try it too. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel like you ever get to, a chance to do that with your girlfriends or? I told one of them today, actually, because mm -hmm. she was going through a lot. The boys were spreading rumors and all. And this is in my class. I told her, go to the teacher, because they weren't bothering me in it. And I didn't go to the teacher, though. I went up to them and explained it to them. It, it, it's nothing. There you go. That's right. She, right to the shut source. Up. Shut up. It's nothing. <laughs> it's just that these girls out here are just scared of these boys. And I'm not a scared person. What? I'll get to you. I'm just not a scared person. I'll go up to the boy and I'll say, what's up? What's the deal? Mm -hmm. Because That's right, baby. Day, I still have to mm -hmm. respect myself. And I'm trying to get it out there. That yeah. I know I'm young, you know. At the same time, yeah, I see no what's in this world. And that's honestly a blessing that you can, you have that strength. And I pray that that continues on for you. A lot of, but a lot of young women, or a lot of even older women, like, <laughs> getting up there. Um, we sometimes we can't find a voice as strong as yours, so we need your help when it comes to just saying, you know, y'all should try to deal with it this way, you know. So that's just I pray that you continue doing what you're doing. I pray that you do more if whenever you continue to gather the strength, because you're obviously a very strong young woman, and we all commend you for that. And we just really would love to use your voice to continue to be strong and help the other youth uh, to gain their voice as well, like through your voice. <laughs> um, I want to know, as a, as a male and as a father, um, what kind of advice would you give to me that I can share with other men in my church as far as helping them out with their kids if they have issues with them? Anyway. You know, so, I never had a man figure, um, figure in my life. My grandma was with my mom and my dad at the same time. So it's been hard in life. But just tell them, I guess, just tell them, they just got to sit them down and tell them the deal, what's happening out there. I can't be scared, really, to be honest. Because... If y'all cheating out, they're just going to think whatever. Because if y'all don't sit down and tell them yourself, other people are going to put stuff in their head. And they're going to think that, oh, it's right. Because they didn't hear it from y'all at a young age. Um, one of the things that was mentioned upstairs during the call to men was really just about mentoring, males mentoring young men. I think that's super important um, because as was stated, if we didn't have men buying sex, we wouldn't have this issue. Um, and I know it's more of a societal kind of thing, but I really think it's important to reframe masculinity in the way that we think about what it means to be a man. Because we have these young boys out here, you know, treating girls the way that you're talking about. And they're just thinking that's what it means to be a boy. I'm just being a man. Um, so the first thing is definitely mentoring young boys to be better men. As far as the men in your house of worship, I think 
really just creating this culture of, you know, of role models. I mean, obviously, by you being here, you're already doing that. Um, but I think if you have children, if you have a daughter, show her that you're the only man that she'll ever need. You and God, well, God's not a man, but you and God are the only two people, the only two male figures, if you will, that she'll ever need. Um, because just growing up, I guess speaking for myself, and I don't mean to glamorize, and I think the sister in the back raised a good point about us glamorizing relationships with our parents. But I will say I'm a daddy's girl, and I know that I've been approached by men who not necessarily tried to traffic me, but who were like, oh, I can give you this, I can give you that, or you're beautiful. And I'm like, I know my daddy told me that growing up. I know I'm beautiful. Um, <laughs> and actually, my sister shared, thank you, <laughs> my sister shared the same thing where actually she was um, propositioned for trafficking. And she was like, well, you know, the guy asked her, oh, you want to make some extra money? And she was like, no, my daddy gives me my money. I don't need anything. So if you have a daughter, I would definitely just be that provider for her. Let her know that you're, you're the only man that she'll ever need. If you have a son, let him know what it means to be a man. Let him know that, you know, being a provider and all of that is great. Um, but you don't have to exploit women. You don't have to have this kind of machismo or this unhealthy sort of sense of masculinity that really being a man means being a good person, in my opinion. And, you know, obviously just sharing the things that you were taught, hopefully, or that you believe it um, means to be a good man. We're just going to oh. have to wrap up here. Um, so I see there's one last question that's leaving all around, but ladies, if y'all could just wrap this one last question up quickly, and then we could head on to the whole okay. thing. Um, this is not so much a question as a comment. I work um, the chief for the Bronx for domestic violence and sex offenders. I actually work with the, well, I don't personally work with them, but the officers that work under me work with the perpetrators of these crimes we're talking about, with the domestic violence and the sex offense. And to um, this gentleman, I would just say, you know, we have to stop with the stereotypes of our young girls and telling them as a father or as the men in your church that it's like, oh, don't don't have sex, don't have a boy touching you, don't this, don't that, don't this, because the minute that one of them does against their will, they're not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. right. Because everything is don't, 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 don't. Mm -hmm. We have to change the way we speak to them. I mean, there's a way that you can speak to them if, if you're not, if you don't want them to, to be out there having sex even with their boyfriend, but if you, everything is don't, 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 if that man or that young boy touches them inappropriately, they're not going to tell you. Because it's already like all of the onus is on them. And then it, how do they come tell you if, if they're fearful saying, oh, you might think that I, I said something to him or that I looked at him a certain way or whatever it is. We have to change. The men have to change their conversation to the, their daughters. You know, and the other thing is with um, the young girl that said, you know, we, I understand it's a lot that it's put on you, but we as women, and we heard it right here in this room, mm -hmm. we had best friends too that told us secrets right. and we right. never went anywhere. Mm -hmm. So why are we saying this 12 year old should bear the burden of going telling somebody because every last one of it, whether the best friend was a cousin, your own sister or whoever, right. and we never told anybody. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay? Right. So she is girl. being a yeah. friend just like we were being a, being a friend. We're putting our knowledge now mm -hmm. on her exactly. today. Exactly. Okay? And, and we didn't do it, and she at 12 years old is not going to disclose her best friend's secrets either. Right. We still carrying it. But she has a grandmother that's going to help her to carry it, just like our parents helped us to carry our friend's secrets. We also have to, when we have young girls, I have two boys and a girl. But my daughter and, and my um, girlfriend, her daughter, we know they're, they're friends. And we, some of them, we old timers be like, oh, she fast. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That's the one I want in my, in my house. house too. Because I have her ear when oh, she's in my you. house. And I can get in her ear and tell her things that she might not be hearing at home. Right. So we have to stop. We have to train our daughters what to do so they go out there and nobody is going to pull them left or right. But then they can pull people to them so we as the, the, the adults can deposit stuff. Stop saying, I don't, want, I don't want you around that girl. Mm -hmm. That's the one you as the adult, you want to be around. So you can pull, deposit something in her. And that's what we have to do as women because she's always going to be a girl and a keeper of her best friend's secrets. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay, that's until she gets our age and knows better and knows how to say something different because we did the same thing. So I applaud you. Yes, I You'll be all right. You have a grandmother, and that's what you can pour out to. But you keep being a friend to your friends. Yeah. 
And just really quickly, I'm going to let them all uh, close off with their last couple of words. But uh, after that, if y'all could just give them a round of applause again, just because they did such a good job. Last thing I want to say really quickly um, to address your point, and also hers, um, a lot of the young people these days are looking up to hip-hop videos and music videos mm -hmm. to really dictate their lifestyle, and so a lot of times, I'll speak for the boys, when the boys, they see, you know, pimping and having that money and, you know, not caring and F these bees and whatever, uh -huh. that's what they see, uh -huh. and so that's what they think it means to be a man, and redefining masculinity, it's really, really important to say, you don't look to the videos to tell you what it means to be a man. You look to me to be a man. Or you look to your mom to show you how to treat a woman, you know? Um, and so that is really, you know, they have that pimp lifestyle, that money and sex, all of that. That's the best thing to have, and that's how to live your life. And that's not the case. So just making sure that they're not looking to the videos and, and the art, even some of the artists, um, to really show them how to be a man or even how to carry themselves as a woman. <laughs> Example for these young women, if you don't show them the care and the love for them, for your for your daughters, and that to tell them that you're here, and just like for one today, you say that you look good, you're pretty, you're caring, just say one positive thing. I learned that from Lady Van, by the way. You always gotta say one positive thing to them, at least like once a day, to compliment them or on their grade or anything, and just show care. I'm going to read this text message. You're dumb, cute, and beautiful, and I would love to to write you a paragraph on how much I love you. I know you don't know me, and I don't know you, but I saw your Facebook photo, and I said, damn, there's a God. I would love to cuff you up and make you mine. I would give you, like, the world. You're so beautiful. And... He would just keep saying, self, what's up, beautiful. And this was a paragraph from a guy that she doesn't know. She don't know. Mm-mm. Don't know. And then I have other messages saying, can I, I don't know them, by the way. Hey, can I have a kiss? And then another one says, hi, beautiful. You look, you're looking so very nice. You are. And another one says, hi. So for these, I just recommend that you guys just, and you just need to be there for them and just tell them what's out there. For example, if y'all want, I can show this around so y'all can see the message. But <laughs> it's scary because if they freak me, he looks like he's 22, fat and everything. <laughs> and everything. And the other one is just like, ew. So, That's my girl. <laughs> it's just uh, to me, but to young ages, and remember, I'm just 12. And this happened like when I just turned 12. So it's really scary out there. If y'all want, I will just show it around y'all want to. After, baby. After. <laughs> but for you, for, you have a daughter? Yes. How old is she? She's 24. Whoops, that <laughs> ship has sailed. I'm 10 year old in Florida. 10 year old? But I, I just asked because I know that there's some men in my church that. Some of them probably have daughters, or they might have a friend. So I just want to be able to give advice to them as to how to approach or handle situations. Uh, for me, like with my oldest daughter, um, me and her mother weren't together. So I, I know that as a father, I made a mistake. And when I had her every other weekend, I treated her more as a friend than as a father figure. I was trying to be more of a boy than, listen, I'm dad. So, and it led to, as life progressed, um, we just fell, fell apart and had a downfall. But praise God that uh, I speak to her now in yeah. communication. Okay. Um, well, just the last thing, just to wrap up, I think, again, for all caregivers, for parents, guardians, just try to have a relationship with your young people. Um, this is, again, not to glamorize it, but really just having, them having a person to lean on is really important. So you've reached out to your daughter, you guys are fixing things now. Um, I think that's really important. I think it's 
it's important not to underestimate the importance or the significance of having someone to reach out to. So that's it. Excellent. And again, I just want to ask everybody to give a huge round of applause for these women because they have done more in their short young lives than a lot of us can even imagine to do. So we just thank you all, honestly. Thank you all for being here. And just to remind you all again, on June, June 24th, we have our uh, second graduation ceremony. So we hope to see you all there. And if you're not part of the Not On My Watch organization as of yet, um, the next class, uh, next cohort will, cohort will start in uh, November 2017 with following the graduation in January, I believe January uh, 2018. So we hope that everybody becomes part of the organization. And the very last thing I want to mention is um, that, you know, we are an organization that is donation based. So if anybody has that opportunity to give, we are able to continue to keep running just because of your generosity. So just please keep that in mind. Um, next, we have our very last part upstairs in the auditorium. Hope to see you all there. Thank you again, again for these women.